Number one, they've had a head injury. Two, the index of suspicion. Three, they have symptoms of brain dysfunction with or without loss of consciousness. This can be really hard for, for professionals to figure out. But the first step starts with trying to understand that individual's brain processing speed. Are they functioning normally for their normal? And uh, ultimately, MRI, you know, a lot of people think MRI or CT define whether you have a concussion or not. Uh, by definition, a concussion with a, is, is usually associated with a normal MRI or CT, meaning it's a mild traumatic brain injury, but you don't see bleeding, you don't see bruising, you don't see something else which is physically dangerous and obvious. And that's why it's such a silent and dangerous disease process, because you don't see anything. People are fooled into thinking it's okay to go out, and there are consequences to that. When in doubt, game over. I mean, that's harsh. And, you know, what if it's the playoffs? What if it's league city championship? Well, you know what? It, there are a lot more important things out there. Ideally, you want this kid to keep playing and keep playing safely. Um, if there is loss of consciousness or neurological symptoms without loss of consciousness, processing speed is down. The athlete should be evaluated by a trained concussion healthcare provider or athletic trainer, and if not available, and, and, and the, the, the index of suspicion is there that this kid is not functioning normally, and he took the head hit, he needs to not play until he's checked by a professional who's trained in concussion. That's the safest way to go, and it's, a, it's the appropriate way to go. You know, my, I, have, I have five kids. They're all, I, I promise you, in my house, we're not trying to find excuses to not play sports. It's pretty much an expectation for part of their personal development, and, and we are big fans of sports in my family, but, you know, it doesn't mean uh, we can't do it for the long haul, and that is the goal. Uh, the consequences, and, and, and this is the, the tricky part. This is the part that ultimately we see every other day in, in the internet news right now where so-and-so just had a catastrophic brain injury and is in a coma or died or, or is vegetative or is recovering from that vegetative injury. Second impact syndrome can occur after that initial event. That initial event was there. The second impact can be minor. It doesn't have to be major. Um, bottom line, the small little blood vessels that go throughout the brain can rupture and, and swell and fluid leaks out and the cells actually get damaged and it's because of that rattle effect of the brain which is gelatinous within the box of the skull and that, that to and fro motion can rip those little vessels and get bruising, bleeding and swelling within the brain and depending on what part of the brain is involved or how extensive that is, it, it can be life threatening and brain damaging. Um, bottom line, some people will die from this. Some people oftentimes more importantly can live but with severe permanent consequences. And uh, yeah, so this needs to be thought of when we're making that emotional decision about, well, I think they have a concussion, but no, no buts, just objectively, unemotionally. If you think they have a concussion but you're not sure, they need to sit until they're evaluated. <coughs> Who can intervene? Uh, coaches, athletes, parents, trainers, Facility management, owners, anybody can intervene. Again, index of suspicion. We need better honesty, better communication, and, and better recognition. Education to all layers of the team, particularly the kids. The kids are under so much pressure to perform and to please and to be okay, and, and, and uh, you, know, you can't trust the kids. Uh, they need to be taught. They need to be reminded it's okay to say if you're not feeling right. Other teammates should be encouraged to, to tattle on their teammate who isn't quite right. It, it goes from top to bottom. Um, what if the kid, kid says he's fine? You know, you, you shouldn't be trusting a kid with a brain injury, bottom line. So if you suspect it, that's it. Um, once it's suspected, trainer, physician, training concussion, same day in play is, is suspended unless cleared. Uh, treating athletic trainers and physicians have been assisted by guidelines. You know, concussion is hard because they're, they're, it's such a vague diagnosis, it's such a vague set of symptoms, it's, it's so hard to figure out objectively in a test. You can't order a blood test and say, oh, he's got a concussion. When do you go back? When can you play? When can you train? There have been guidelines that have been established by uh, uh, multiple organizations and, and the consensus statement on concussion basically is that overview of medical issues for team physicians. It's a complete guide of considerations and treatment recommendations. 
There is no ultimate you know, algorithm that says this is what you do. It's all high level recommendations. Concussion management is at the end of the day customized to every individual athlete and their unique situation. <coughs> uh, within concussion treatments, there are immediate game day, game on decisions, there are post game day decisions, and there are return to play decisions. Uh, the consensus statement was basically a collaboration of family physicians, orthopedic surgeons, sports medicine, society for sports medicine, orthopedic, uh, osteopathic. Everybody was involved who has a role in treating sports injuries. The game day decisions, bottom line, return to play once con concussion suspected has a risk. If, if you let someone play and you think they had a concussion but you're not sure and there's not enough objective data to say he does and you let him play, those are the ones that are getting hurt badly and that we're seeing in the news. So again, uh, that index of suspicion is key. If there is amnesia, looking backwards, which is retrograde, right after the accident of what happened or, or any detail of, of what you're asking them or communicating, if there's amnesia at all or loss of consciousness, they really should not return to play. They need to be professionally evaluated. Uh, return to play for a normal evaluation by someone who's capable of giving a normal evaluation. In most cases, it's the trainer. Um, the coach usually doesn't have that, that tool toolkit in his um, bag. So oftentimes, if you're lucky, you'll have a team physician, but not at the kid level. That's usually going to be high school and above. Uh, home with observation for player. Uh, bottom line, if he's stable after multiple obs observations. If he's not stable, if symptoms are getting worse, that kid needs to go to the ER. He needs that CAT scan to make sure he doesn't have a bruise or a bleed or some life-threatening problem. <coughs> Post-game decisions. Again, it depends on the details. You're looking at trends. You're looking at, is this getting better or worse? Is their processing speed improving, shrinking, or staying the same? Uh, you need to look at it over time because that trend is going to be more important than the detail that you're talking about. Diagnostic imaging, well, you do it really when you see someone going the wrong direction in their trends or if somebody's just not improving as you would expect. And, and what you're looking for, again, are, are, are the more important things from a neurosurgeon standpoint, bruising, bleeding, something that could be life-threatening. Uh, uh, coordination of care, follow-up is key for the post-game decisions. There needs to be uh, a good follow-up mechanism. A lot of kids that play in a lot of the best sports programs in this country don't have great economic resources for health care. That's a problem. Facilities and coaches and teams need to get involved in, in at least being that little voice that says, hey, get checked, do it the right way. Ultimately, um, restrict activity uh, until their symptoms go away, support the family, make sure school is covered because one of the biggest liabilities in concussion in the kid athlete is that they go to school, they fail courses, they don't get proper support in the school and ultimately it affects not only their athletics but their education as well. Uh, there were guidelines developed in 2008 for return to sport, how you should do it. You know, it's really tricky and it's really complex and it takes a lot of experience by trained concussion people to implement it, but the bottom line, it's broken into phases. The most obvious, the first phase, post-concussion, no strenuous activity, no. That also means video games. So one of the things people don't realize is, oh, they're sitting down, they're not doing anything. High-level mental processing actually worsens the symptoms and the duration of long-term concussion. So kids that are off major activity but at home parked on their Xbox are not doing themselves a favor. So that's one of the things that needs to be discussed. Uh, phase two, light aerobic. They're okay. They're starting to run. They're starting to bike. They're starting to swim. They're okay. That's fine. Then they advance to phase three, sport-specific training, but no contact. Uh, phase four, high-level processing drills in sport. Phase five, full contact. Make sure symptoms haven't returned. Return to play next. This is the largest international consensus on concussion that's been done, and uh, it's pretty well well uh, described. Recovery is completely unpredictable. Every unique concussion, even in every unique athlete, is completely different. And uh, it needs to be treated as, as a unique phenomenon. Uh, adolescents and children, this is another myth actually. You would think kids heal faster than adults. In concussion, it's not true. The brain's more immature. The, the, the sheaths that surround the neurons <laughs> and protect the brain are actually 
less well developed in a child than they are in a fully developed adult. And um, so their processing speed is affected easier than an adult's and it takes longer for them to bounce back from a concussion when they have one. Uh, no test or symptom can predict full recovery. If you see major dizziness, vertigo, wobbliness, that's a severe, severe sign of a long-lasting concussion and one of the most obvious signs of a long-lasting concussion. Prevention. There are a lot of issues in prevention. You know, it's going to happen in sport. I, I think when I think of prevention, the first thing that comes to my head is preventing a slight concussion from progressing into a major concussion by appropriate early intervention because the slight concussion will be, the kid will bounce back quickly. Uh, that next one is going to really, really hurt him. Uh, better education, better tackling, better technique. Uh, there, there's so many in football, you know, the spearing, the head-to-head -head contact, using the head as, as your tackling device, all those things. You know, at the level of assassin-like football play the kids are playing today, it, it's hard to teach against that, but that has to be one of the fundamentals going forward 10, 20 years is let's go back to old school fundamentals as far as tackling and how we do things. Better equipment is controversial because particularly young people think if they've got this really cool helmet, they can use their head all they want and they can hit as hard as they want. You know, uh, there, there have been a lot of uh, people who think that if we went back to uh, no helmets that that would be safer. I, I'm not in favor of that, but I think the bottom line point is uh, a good equipment is a substitute for good technique and, and intelligent performance in sport. Less contact in practice, you know, uh, there's a role for contact, uh, speed, proficiency, et cetera. But, you know, I think uh, we need to be careful not to just do it to be tough rather than do it to teach skills and teach game readiness. Um, Bottom line, the reason we do this is to play again. And, and to, to Dr. Delicato's point, the, the, the dropout rate in kids' sports, the obesity rate in American youth, it, it's disturbing um, how, how, how high these numbers are. And, and we need to do everything we can to keep our, our children active into young adult and, and middle age and older life. That's the best quality of life, the best quality of health, and uh, the most fun while we're at it. Anyway, thank you. You are the critical part of the team where the rubber meets the road to keep our kids safe. In my opinion, the, this population is the neglected population. 